All right, welcome everyone. And thank you so much for joining this evening. It's the January 19th Dr. Cog Board of Directors meeting. I'm Ashley Stolzman, the chair of the Dr. Cog uh, Board of Directors and I'll call the meeting to order. First up this evening, we'll have a roll call and introduction of new members and alternates. We have a lot of new members this evening. And so um, pay very close attention because what I'm gonna ask of everybody is that if you are in a jurisdiction that is directly adjacent to a jurisdiction with a new member, that you reach out to the new member. Give them an email or a call, welcome them, say hello. Maybe even you know go for a walk somewhere outside or get a coffee together just to you know meet each other and introduce yourselves to one another. And then to the new members, um, if you listen for the names of other new members, if you want to try to connect with at least one other new member, then you can start this Dr. Cog journey together. It does sort of seem strange when you join the Dr. Cog board, I can remember that, and that there's just a lot of faces that you meet all at once, but you'll get up to speed in no time um, whatsoever. So don't worry about that. And so I just first like to start out by welcoming um, the new members this evening. And so the ones that I have heard about are Ari Harrison from the town of Erie, Jamie Jeffrey from the town of Lock Buey, Lisa Smith from the city of Arvada, Nicole Spear from the city of Boulder, Othaniel Sierra from the city of Inglewood, Paul Hasseman from the city of Golden, Jan Plowski from the city of Brighton, Jim Torini from the city of Decono. So welcome to all of those new members who are with us this evening. And for new alternates, we have David Ott from the town of Lock Bowie, Brian Wong from the city of Lafayette, Stephen Ward from the city of Inglewood, Sonia Jensen from the city of Federal Heights, and Don Cameron from the city of Golden. So just really warm welcome to everyone and please do reach out to one another because uh, that's a lot of new members and normally we get to see each other in person and really welcome each other and get to know each other and exchange business cards and things like that. So in this virtual environment, we really have to make an extra effort um, to get to know one another so we can start working together and helping make the region a better place. And so um, with that warm welcome to everyone, I'll turn it over to Melinda Stevens for a roll call. And I'll just announce to folks that we're still moving people over from attendee to panelist. So if we miss you, don't worry, we'll catch you at the end and we'll get it all, all straightened up. Melinda, take it away. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. And I will go ahead and get started. <clears throat> uh, Allison Coombs from the city of Aurora. Mike Kaufman of Aurora. Ari Harrison of Erie, Sarah Laughlin of Erie, Bill Van Meter of RTD, present, Bud Starker of Wheat Ridge, happy to be here, Claire Levy of Boulder County, Matt Jones of Boulder County, Colleen Whitlow of Mead, good morning, good evening, hi, <laughs> thank you. Craig Hurst of Commerce City. Susan Noble of Commerce City. David Spellman of Blackhawk. Deborah Mulvey of Castle Pines. Here. Don Cognac of Firestone. David Whelan of Firestone. George Lance of Greenwood Village. Here. George Teal of Douglas County. Abe Layden of Douglas County. Jamie Jeffrey of Lock Bowie. Present. Jane Plowski of Brighton. It's Jan, but I'm oh, here. <laughs> my apologies. There's no That's ease. That's okay. That's <laughs> Thank okay. <laughs> you. Jason Gray of Castle Rock. Here. Jeff Baker of Arapahoe County. Here. Jessica Sandgren of Thornton. Here. Jim Torini of Decono, Catherine Whitman of Decono, Joan Peck of Longmont, John Dyack of Parker. Here. Josie Cockrell of Foxfield. Here. Julie Duran Mullica of North Glen. Joyce Downing of North Glen. Cara Tanucci of Central City. Here. Kevin Flynn of Denver. Here. Christopher Larson of Nederland. Larry Vidum of Bennett. Here. 
Linda Montoya of Federal Heights. Sonia Jensen of Federal Heights. Lisa Smith of Arvada. Bob Pfeiffer of Arvada. I'm here, but I think you're trying to screw with us. But we're all out of alphabetical order, so I'm lost. <laughs> Thank you for listening, Linda. I know I'm what trying. you're trying. <laughs> it's a trick, everybody. <laughs> hey, we need all Thanks, help. Bob. <laughs> all right, Lynette Kelsey of Georgetown. <laughs> Keith Holmes of Georgetown. Margot Ramsden of Bomar. Michael Hillman of Idaho Springs. Neil Shaw of Superior. Here. Nicholas Angelo of Lyons. Holly Rogan of Lyons. Nicholas Williams of Denver. Here. Nicole Spear of Boulder. Here. Othaniel Sierra of Inglewood. I'm here. Paul Hassman of Golden. Here. Paul Sutton of Morrison. Sean Foray of Morrison. Rachel Binkley of Glendale. Ryan Toucher of Glendale. Randy Wheel of Cherry Hills Village. Russell Stewart of Cherry Hills Village. Randy Wheelock of Clear Creek County. Here. Rebecca White of CEDAW. Here. Roy Palmer of Columbine Valley. Sally Chafee of CEDAW. Here. Sally Daigle of Sheridan. Sarah Nirmella of Westminster. Bruce Baker of Westminster. Stephanie Walton of Lafayette. Hello. Oh, thank you. Uh, Stephen Barr of Littleton. Here. Steve Odoricio of Adams County. Steve. Hey. How you doing? <laughs> Hi. <laughs> uh, Stephen Conklin of Edgewater. Here and welcome to all the new members and alternates. Thank you, Director Conklin. Uh, Tammy Maurer of Centennial. Present. Tracy Craft Tharp of Jefferson County. Yes. Webb Sill of Gilpin County. William Lindstedt of Broomfield. Here. Wynn Shaw of Lone Tree. Present. All right. Uh, with that, Madam Chair, we do have a quorum, and I will hand it back to you for anyone who wasn't able to speak. Excuse me. This is this is Randy Wheel. I'm here. Happy Thank to be you. here. Thank you, Randy. Any other members, go ahead and raise your hand um, by clicking the raise hand icon if you think we didn't catch you for attendance. We do have a record of the panelists, so we can double check it with that. And so it looks like we have everybody accounted for. Thank you all very much. Could I please um, get a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Thank you. We have a, a motion from Larry Vidim and Stephanie Walton. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Any discussion of the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Thank you, everyone. The motion carries. And so that takes us to the report of the chair. Um, I'd just like to take a brief moment, um, if I could, um, for folks who don't know me, um, I'm the Dr. Cog. Uh, chair, but I'm also the mayor of the city of Louisville. And I just want to take a moment um, to thank everyone um, from the bottom of my heart, our community, um, Neil Shaw, Superior Trustee, and, and my community and Claire Levy um, from Boulder County um, was just devastated by fire at the end of the year and beginning of the year. And um, it was, it, it truly the word devastation doesn't actually describe the, the depth of the feeling that I have for what's occurred. <laughs> but the bright, place um, in all of it is really the regionalism and the Colorado spirit that's come through. Um, we've never had to ask for help in the ways we've had to ask for help in this time. And the help has been there tremendously, um, hundreds of times over what I could have ever imagined. 
Um, your staff members, your communities have all helped us and reached out to offer help. Um, many of you have offered personal help and brought supplies and resources to our community um, and even just sent kind notes and lent a helping hand. People have made monetary donations that are incredibly generous to try to help offset the devastation. So just really that Colorado spirit is unbelievable. And people describe the Denver Regional Council of Governments as a collaborative and a group that works together and things like that. But I never really fully understood it um, until we were in such a dark moment that we needed help. And I just, I can't thank you all enough for everything you've done for our communities. And I um, didn't tell Neil, I was going to turn it over to him, but I want to offer um, Director Shaw a moment if he would like to say anything as well. I appreciate that, Mayor Stoltzman. I don't have much to add other than to just echo the sentiment. Um, I think everybody within our communities has felt a, an outpouring of just um, incredible generosity. Uh, I don't think any of us expected it. Um, and also, I have to apologize for all the emails and texts that you know I probably received over a three or four day span. I think I probably responded to 10% of them. So I know a lot of you wanted to know how we're doing. Um, I think Superior, you know, we're, we're, we're going to get through this, you know, 8% of our housing is gone, um, you know, and I think we, we've got a long way ahead of us. And as I mentioned in the finance and budget meeting, we have a town staff of 40. We have a budget, or I'm sorry, a building and planning division of one person. We're going to process 400 permits this year. Um, that's, that's the goal. So we are going to be reaching out to everybody and anybody that can help us out uh, to get through this. So thank you, um, everyone. Thank you very much, Director Shaw. And I know um, Commissioner Levy would have the same comments. She has a, a town hall with some of the folks tonight that's going on at the same time of the meeting, but just all of our communities have felt tremendously supported by you all. And we really can't thank you enough. And so with that, I'll turn it over to a report from the Performance and Engagement Committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you to all the committee members who participated two weeks ago tonight. We had a virtual meeting and we talked about two uh, primary topics. One is the annual award celebration and the work staff is doing it at uh, planning. While we still don't know exactly if it'll be virtual or live, I, I wanna thank staff for just their amazing work at uh, planning and working on sponsorships and those type of things. Uh, obviously, I, I imagine Director Rex will say the same thing, but if any uh, community or that is interested in sponsoring, uh, there's absolutely a need for that in terms of the annual awards celebration, making that happen. And then we also talked about the 2022 board workshop. Uh, obviously our 2021 board workshop did not happen. And we are at this point planning and looking at, at making a, a board workshop a reality mid-year. So uh, stay tuned for more details. That is my report. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. And next we have a report from the Finance and Budget Committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, at this evening's Finance and Budget Committee meeting, we authorized the Executive Director to negotiate and execute a contract with Clifton Larson Allen for approximately $88,394 for the term of January 2022 through December 2023 with an option to renew for two additional one-year terms. We also authorized the executive director to enter into a contract with the Colorado Department of Human Services to receive approximately <clears throat> 0.7 million in, uh, from the ARPA for Older Americans Act programs and services through September 30th, 2024. Madam Chair, this concludes my report. Thank you very much, Director Shaw. And so that um, will take us to a report from our Executive Director, Doug Rex. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'd like to start this evening by drawing your attention to a few uh, information items that are in your packet this evening, um, because there won't be a specific briefing on those. Uh, but Attachment G, um, I, it, it was the, um, it's the slate of, of uh, uh, board officers from, from the nominating committee is their recommendation. It's in the packet for your information this evening and will be voted on at the uh, February board meeting. Um, attachment J is the draft 2022 policy statement on federal legislative issues. As the memo suggests, staff did not make any, any changes of any consequence in that we, uh, we, we made some changes in there to refer to the new Federal Transportation Act um, and change some dates in there from 2021 to 2022, but there was nothing significant. But please, if you get an opportunity to review that document, and if you have any suggested changes, please let staff know as soon as you can so we can 
we can finalize that document to get it on the agenda for, for approval next month. And last but not least, I would like to mention uh, attachment K, um, our state our state lobbyists, um, Bowditch and Castle, they provided a uh, kind of a, a legislative preview um, in the packet. They always do a great job with that. So I just wanted to make sure you're aware that's in there. Um, my next item is uh, earlier this afternoon, we sent out a solicitation uh, for your interest to serve on, on one of the two board committees, the Finance and Budget Committee or the uh, Performance and Engagement Committee. Um, the the email includes some attachments about the bylaws and the guidelines and some information about those committees. Um, board members serve two-year terms if, if selected. Um, and uh, so those that you know, whose terms are not expiring, they don't have to submit. And that was included in the email itself. Um, so there's approximately about six spots, seats open on each committee. Um, so I would strongly encourage you if you're interested in one of those to, uh, to let Melinda know if you're interested and state your preference of which committee. And then the nominating committee will be uh, considering all requests and uh, the, it's anticipated that, um, that the new members will be seated at the uh, February board meeting as well. Uh, Director Conklin mentioned the, uh, the board retreat, our annual board retreat. As you know, it didn't work out last year because of COVID, but we are planning and we're hopeful that this year we can have an in-person in, uh, in event. Um, it's tentatively scheduled for late March, early April. We'll get further uh, confirmation on that when we talk to the uh, Performance and Engagement Committee at, you know, on February 2nd. Um, and because of COVID and just the uncertainty associated with, we are gonna host that meeting at Dr. Cog's offices. We had looked at some other places. And as you know, we typically have done that offsite, gone up in the hills uh, several times, down in the springs, up north. So this time we're gonna just uh, stay close to home just in the case, cause you know, we just really don't know what's gonna happen from here on out with regards to COVID. Um, so we'll of course be sending out some additional information um, once the dates and agenda are confirmed. So uh, please stand by. Hey, I would like to share a little bit of good news as it relates to uh, air quality, because Lord knows we've had a lot of conversations about uh, some of, some of the, the problems that, ex that truly do exist within our region. Um, after being out of attainment for carbon monoxide for, for, for 10 years or so, and that was followed by a mandatory 20 year maintenance period on, on January 14th of this year, um, the Denver area uh, became one of the first regions in the nation to fully um, to come fully back into attainment for, for carbon monoxide. So that, that's, that's really, really great news. Um, carbon uh, monoxide emissions, they're at a fraction of what they were 30 years ago. Um, you know, we, we're, we're certainly going to celebrate this accomplishment, and you all should too, because they, a lot of the, the mitigation strategies that we have taken credit for through the years is, uh, is, is due in, in large part to, um, to work that you all have been doing out in the communities with regards to sweepers and all that kind of good stuff. So um, thank you all very much. Um, I, well, the sweepers are on the particular side, but you guys have done, done plenty on the carbon monoxide side as well. Um, and we're also, you know, we're hopeful, of course, that we can find the same level of success with today's transportation emission challenges. And we'll continue to take that head on as we, as we go forward. Um, what else? Oh, the 2022 awards celebration. Um, so we're, we're currently scheduled um, to hold that event on April 22nd, sorry, April 27th at Empower Field at Mile High. Um, we are anticipating and had a great conversation with the Performance and Engagement Committee earlier this month. And uh, I think it, they've uh, expressed everyone's desire to try to do that in person, if at all possible. So we're planning and, and uh, moving towards that. Um, so please mark your calendars for that. And of course, we'll be sending out a lot of information uh, here, in, here in the near future. We, you know, we did an awards solicitation that closed um, on Friday and we got some great, great um, uh, applications in um, for all the awards, quite frankly. So we're really excited to to be able to share the successes of our region um, at that event. Uh, I will like to just put a quick plug in there and uh, Director Conklin also mentioned this, that you know, with regards to our sponsorship effort, we're, we're not quite sure what the atmosphere is gonna be like out there trying to get sponsorships from, from private sector. Um, so if you have any ins or you, you uh, um, can you know, provide us with any leads or you can reach out to some folks, we would truly appreciate it. If this is a major lift for us every year to try to raise this kind of money, 
we're, we're our budget is about 70,000 for this event. So it's, 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 you know, it's real money. And, and, um, and we've always tried to accomplish that through sponsorship. So if you have any idea, any leads at all, please just send them our way and, uh, and uh, we'll chase those down. Winter Bike to Work Day uh, is scheduled for Friday, uh, February 11th. And our Way to Go team is working with our partners across the region to, to, uh, to host this winter version of the event. It's, um, it's intended to show that on most days, even, even in the winter months, biking to and from work is a viable option. Um, it, of course, it doesn't rival our, our summer event in terms of participation, um, but we've really shined in international challenges associated with this. Uh, Pre-pandemic, both Denver and Boulder finished first and second in the world, respectively, so that's not too shabby. So it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a pretty cool event. It's a fun event, right? So um, appreciate anything that you might be able to do with share with that with your, your, um, with your constituents. So, Madam Chair, I believe that is my report. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Executive Director Rex. And um, all that was a lot of material for folks. Um, it's all posted on our um, website, on the Dr. Cog website in the calendar. If you're looking for things and a new member, that's a really great place to go look for those dates and actions. And then you'll, you'll see emails in your inbox from Melinda and Doug. And so that um, takes us to our public comment period tonight. Up to 45 minutes is now allocated for public comment and each speaker will be limited to three minutes. If there are additional requests for the public to access the board, time will be allocated at the end of the meeting to complete the comment. I would request that there's no public comment on an issue for um, a public hearing that we've already held before the board. Consent and action items will begin immediately after the last speaker. Any members of the public that would care to comment? Go ahead and raise your hand by clicking the raise hand icon as described on the screen um, and it's at the bottom of your panel. First we have Marie Venner. Marie, you might need, there you go. Hello, um, I'm a former Littleton Planning Commissioner and, and worked on uh, an earlier iteration of, of uh, Metrovision. Thanks so much for your service. I'm here this evening on behalf of over 30 business, faith, community, and other organizations. We want to see good, equitable, cost-effective planning that doesn't worsen ozone. It can be done, but not by continuing to do the same things. We've had the same general focus for transportation improvement dollars for 50 to 70 years. And now USDOT has acknowledged that its priorities and state DOT priorities have over impacted and underserved many people. 20 to 40% of the people in each community do not drive. Um, we, I can submit four references for that. These neighbors, some of whom have shown up tonight, um, and in addition to our over 30 organizations, we also have the Colorado Cross Disabilities uh, Coalition and um, someone from the Rocky Mountain Bus Riders uh, Union uh, tonight. But we, we all get to breathe more air pollution from transportation improvements. And um, some of these folks don't even benefit from what has been funded. I'm one who did benefit disproportionately driving in from the urban edge, uh, shaving a few minutes off my commute. Um, but highway efficiency and capacity improvements are a recipe for growing numbers of cars and growing air pollution. 700 million is supposed to be spent on Floyd Hill, adding lanes, but CDOT models say it will reduce BMT, even though it adds vehicle throughput. Everyone knows that that's wrong and misleading. Um, you just have to think about it. The research is conclusive now that lane additions lead to additional vehicles and pollution on a one-to-one -one basis by years five through 10. Our road networks are comprehensive and connected. 95% were built by 1980, but we still need comprehensive, safe, accessible networks of broadband, bikeways, and transit. The Metro Vision Plan 2050 identifies a lot of what is needed to meet shortfalls for the underserved. 3.2 billion in projects that improve safety and access and build out missing systems that will improve rather than worsen our air quality. These projects need to go to the top of the priority list this, these next four years. And not just mobility management, all of the metro area projects and funding. 
Colorado citizens and Metro residents were promised a 26% pollution reduction by 2025 and 50% by 2030. This can only be achieved by big reorientation of where and how our infrastructure funds are spent. We Thank can't you. get there by widening highways this next four years or 10 years. Thank Those you, Marie. If you could just wrap up. Last two sentences. We are the people, businesses, communities, congregations who live here with the consequences. So we are asking you tonight to put first things first. No investments that expand driving or highways this next decade. Instead, invest in building out the missing access and mobility systems that improve air quality. It's 2022 and it's never been clearer, easier or more necessary to make the shift. We're counting on you. Thanks. Thank you. Next in the queue, um, we have uh, Pip Van Heuven from Bicycle Colorado. Let me just get you unmuted here. Here you go. Great, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, thank you so much. Good evening, uh, Mayor Stolzman, Dr. Cog, board members. Uh, thanks so much for hearing my comment tonight. Uh, my name is Pete Van Heuven. I'm Director of Government Relations for Bicycle Colorado. Later tonight, you're going to be asked whether Dr. Cog should support House Bill 1028, which concerns how users of small profile non-motorized vehicles like bikes proceed through intersections, and we urge you to support the bill. Put simply, the bill allows people on bikes and other small profile vehicles to treat stop signs as yield signs and stop lights as stop signs, proceeding only when the coast is clear and it's safe to do so. I wanna be very clear, this doesn't do anything to change the laws of the right of way. A person on a bike cannot proceed unless they have the right of way and that will not change. At Bicycle Colorado, we call the actions that would be legalized in this bill the safety stop. And we call it that because the data is very clear when this is legalized, intersections are safer for people, bicyclists and motorists alike. Intersections are the most dangerous location for bicyclists in Colorado and elsewhere. The most recent data we have from CDOT shows 72% of reported crashes between people biking and driving take place at intersections or are intersection related. And yet other states have had fantastic safety results when they've adopted the safety stop. As two examples, Delaware adopted in 2017 and saw a 23% reduction in crashes at stop sign controlled intersections in the 30 months after adopting compared to the 30 months prior. And Idaho, which adopted this in 1982 over 40 years ago, saw a 15% drop in crashes in the year after adoption. Boise was shown to be 30 to 60% safer for bicyclists than similar sized cities. Delaware, Idaho, and six other states have these laws, and the numbers are growing every year, and Colorado should be a part of that, because when bicyclists are able to get out of the intersection and away from that conflict zone before a potential crash can even occur, their safety improves. So with these numbers in mind, I would like to point out that the bill aligns really nicely with other Dr. Cog priorities, most importantly, the Regional Vision Zero Plan, which sets a goal of zero traffic fatalities and serious injuries on our roadways by 2050. Supporting the safety stop also supports Dr. Cog's goal this year of improving safety for users of alternative modes, especially pedestrians and bikes. And beyond that, safety stop has benefits, including the fact that it's cost neutral. It encourages people to choose non-car modes of transportation, which enhances air quality. It creates uniformity across city and county borders for people who need or choose to use non-car modes. And it has the benefit of removing a crime that can be inequitably enforced, making our roads feel less inviting and safe for black and brown bicyclists. So we ask for your support for House Bill 1028 tonight. The bill is a cost-effective and an immediate tool that will make our roads safer and that bicyclists in your communities have been calling for for years. Dr. Cog's full-throated support will be an important statement in support of the safety of vulnerable road users like bicyclists. Thanks for your time. And a special thanks to uh, Doug Rex for calling out Winter Bike to Work Day, February 11th. We do appreciate it. Thank you very much. Next comment we have from Matt Frommer. All right, can you hear me? We can. Great, thank you. So good evening, Dr. Cog board members and welcome to the new members. My name is Matt Frommer. I'm a Denver resident and I work on clean transportation policy with the Southwest Energy Efficiency Project or SWEEP. First, I wanna commend Dr. Cog's staff for their hard work updating the TIP policy and working with CDOT to implement the new greenhouse gas planning rule. There are a few things I'd like to highlight as we move forward. 
First, I'd like to encourage you to think big on multimodal. As part of the greenhouse gas rulemaking, CDOT modeled a 2030 compliance scenario to envision a more climate-friendly transportation system. The vision includes 1,900 new miles of sidewalk, 5,000 new miles of bike lanes, half of which are protected, and a 6% annual increase in statewide transit service compared to 2019 levels, all leading to a 10% reduction in vehicle miles traveled. Building this system will also deliver the co-benefits of improved safety, public health, and equity, not to mention $10 billion in economic benefits. Building this system will require all levels of government, from CDOT to Dr. Cog to local governments to transit agencies, to uplift and prioritize projects and improve access to clean transportation options like transit, biking, and walking, and build more location-efficient communities that require less vehicle travel. 2022 is a, is a really exciting year for transportation. On top of the new greenhouse gas planning rule, we've got new Senate Bill 260 funds and the federal bipartisan infrastructure law, which will bring $4.7 billion to Colorado over the next five years. About one quarter of the total transportation funds in the federal infrastructure bill, or about $200 billion, will stay with the USDOT and be distributed through competitive discretionary grant programs. USDOT has signaled that it will prioritize projects that improve multimodal connections in communities around the country. In January, the USDOT released a memo of administrative guidance that first encourages funding recipients to prioritize repair and rehabilitation. Second, directs FHWA to simplify the project review process for multimodal projects like bike lane sidewalks and BRT lanes. Three emphasizes operational efficiency over expansion and four, encourages state DOTs to support public transportation projects. Colorado should leverage our state and local transportation funding to secure additional funding from these federal grant programs in order to achieve our environmental and social goals. Let's get creative and bring forward our best multimodal transportation projects. Let's build complete streets on all main streets and urban arterials. Let's build the 10 bus rapid transit projects in the 2050 Metro Vision before 2030. Let's actually fund transit service and bring ridership back to pre-pandemic levels and then some. Let's build a regional bike network that's connected and safe for people to use. Such projects could be perfect candidates for the new federal active transportation infrastructure investment program, the new carbon reduction program, and the metropolitan planning program with its new complete streets set aside. Coloradans want these Thanks, types Matt, of projects. If you could wrap it up for us, that'd be great. Thank you, Matt. Okay, yeah. Well, no, thanks I, for giving me the opportunity you, to speak. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah. Um, and if you have your comments in writing, you're welcome to submit them to us so we can see the full comments. Um, thank you very much for commenting. And our last public comment is from um, Bob Pfeiffer. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I'm taking the time to do this in public comment as an alternate to the board. Um, I just want to make comments back to our communities north of us, um, our city council and our community uh, shares um, our thoughts and prayers to your community, Madam Chair, as well as Superior and Broomfield and the impacted uh, Boulder County. So I just want you to know that um, our community is sincerely um, uh, concerned with what happened up there. And as you know, we've, we've done a lot of mutual aid and I'm very proud of my replacement, Lisa Smith, and uh, her efforts to raise, uh, as you might've seen on the news, the um, gift cards for all the citizens in your communities. This is something that's been raised by uh, my peers and I'm very proud of what they've done. Um, but the, the, the main point I wanna say is we're here to support you, Superior, Broomfield, Boulder County, the whole community. Um, I can watch it from my back porch and it was a horrific night and um, uh, our heart um, is big and swollen for you and your communities. And so if there's anything we can do for you, I just wanted you to know that our bat is here for all of all of our peer groups and um, we love y'all. So that's all I want to say. Thank you very much, Director Pfeiffer. And I really, from every community, I everyone has been so supportive. I really can't put into words how wonderful everyone's been. Thank you very much. And can I ask one last favor while I have the mic? <laughs> Sorry, Melinda, can you move me to attendee? Because I need to respect Lisa's being my- I uh, think the I problem- heard. I think the problem, Bob, is moving you may kick you out of the meeting, so you may have to- I'll, I'll bow out. Just don't let me back in. How's that? Okay. It doesn't right. count. Thank do. you, everybody. All right. Bye-bye.
Thank you, Director Pfeiffer. And um, seeing no other public comment, that takes us to the next portion of our agenda. Um, so next on the agenda is our consent agenda. Is there a motion from a director to approve the consent agenda? And you can go ahead and raise your hand to make the motion. Director Starker. Uh, I move to approve the consent agenda. Is there a second, Director Shaw? Yes, I second the motion. Thank you. Any discussion of the consent agenda for members? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any, any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you, everyone. The consent agenda is approved. So our first action item tonight, you'll be able to find it as attachment D in your packet. It's a discussion on the transportation improvement program, which we often refer to as the TIP for the year 2021 project delays report. Todd Cottrell, our senior transportation planner in transportation planning and operations is going to give us a presentation this evening. Good evening, Todd, and happy new year. Thank you, thank you and thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so the current TIP policy outlines the expectations for the initiation of project phases, including how to address project delays if they do happen. And so regardless of the reasons, these delays do tie up the limited funding that is available uh, to Dr. Cog to allocate. So after the end of federal fiscal year 21 in early October, uh, Dr. Cog requested CDOT and RTD to review the status of those projects that had the FY21 funding. And after confirmation of these statuses, um, staff contacted the sponsors with the project phases that were not initiated and therefore delayed to find out the reasons of why their identified FY21 phase was not initiated, uh, to discover the current status of their project, and then to assist them to de develop a plan to initiate the project phase that was delayed. So the attached report um, that you see on your screen outlines and summarizes those project phases that were delayed as of October 1st. So overall, uh, the project states that 28 projects are first year delayed, uh, in which two have already been initiated and are no longer delayed. Uh, however, since the board agenda was released, uh, two additional details were discovered. Uh, the first being the Superior US 36 bikeway extension project did go to add uh, at, the end of, uh, at the end of December and therefore is no longer delayed. Uh, the second was to the Louisville project um, that in all likelihood that will probably slip one month uh, instead of advertising in February instead of in um, this month in January. So a motion to approve staff's recommendation this evening in addition to those two changes I just stated would allow them to continue. Um, to avoid a second year delay, all of these project phases identified in the report must initiate their delayed phase by July 1st of, of this year. So just a couple quick observations concerning these delays. Um, for the second year in a row, uh, the number of delayed projects is approximately double versus the last two pre-COVID years. Um, so though COVID is not the major reason um, for the current delays in this report, um, we certainly do continue to see the effects from last year um, when earlier project phases happen to be delayed due to COVID-19. Um, and then also when looking at the other details as to why projects are delayed, um, there seems to be a fairly equal distribution of the reasons. Um, and this includes right of way and or utility issues, uh, delays within the IGA process, uh, a lack of or a, a under development of the pre-planning activities or understanding of the federal aid process uh, and mm -hmm. finally staffing losses. Um, so this concludes sort of the summary of the report that's attached. Um, be happy to take any comments or questions you may have. Uh, if not, the motion before you is to approve actions proposed by Dr. Cox staff regarding TIP project delays uh, for federal fiscal year 2021. Thank you very much for the presentation, um, Todd. And are there any directors that have any questions or comments on this agenda item? Um, a director can make a motion to frame the discussion and that, that doesn't cut off any discussion if people want to bring up other questions or comments after that. Director Vida. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move to approve the action proposed by Dr. Cogstaff regarding TIP project delays for fiscal year 2021. Thank you, Director Vedem. Is there a second? Director Walton? Second. Thank you. Any discussion of the motion? And like I said before, we're not trying to cut off any discussion if there are questions or comments on 
the motion, it's totally appropriate to ask of them. All right, seeing no questions or comments on this agenda item, um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposition? Any abstention? Thank you, everyone. The motion carries. And if I can get my agenda packet back up, that takes us to our next um, topic this evening, which is um, attachment E in your packet, a discussion on policy and process for selecting programming transportation improvement program projects for FY 2022 and FY 2027. And Todd, our senior tra transportation planner, will tell us about this as well. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so now that we just went through uh, current projects that just happen to be delayed, uh, we're now going to trans, uh, translate over into the programming of additional and new funds covering uh, the current federal fiscal year all the way out to 2027. Um, so here are the topics uh, on your screen that we're going to be running through tonight. Um, and at the end, um, we will be asking for your approval on uh, number one and number four, covering the TIP policy document and the associated TIP applications. Um, but we wanted to you know, make this a little bit more holistic and cover the entire process um, because there are some unique uh, properties contained within not only the call for projects that we would normally have for the 24 to 27 TIP, uh, but we are also gonna first start looking at programming the additional funds that we have within the current TIP. So first, just wanted to outline some very high level changes that have taken place to the TIP policy document. Uh, and first, and, and this is more probably on a staff level, uh, we have adjusted the title of this document where historically uh, this document would have been called the 24 to 27 TIP policy. We have now adjusted that to be called the policies for TIP program development. However, again, we'll still probably refer to it as the TIP policy document. Uh, the concept here is that we're hoping once this document is adopted, uh, we will not readopt a new policy every four years. However, we will still amend it um, at least every four years when new calls for projects take place. But of course, we can also amend it at any time that is necessary. Um, so just a few other items that are considered higher level within this document. Um, the first being capital project eligibility. Uh, and this really looks at the projects that are within um, the the currently adopted RTP and how those relate to TIP eligibility. Um, we have also updated the set aside programs. Uh, then of course, the previous policy indicated there was TIP focused areas uh, and that was carried through the application process. That has now been replaced with the, the project and program investment priorities contained with the 2050 uh, MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan. And again, we'll explore that in a little bit more detail uh, once we get and talk about the application. Um, next, within both the regional share and sub-regional share, there, are, there have been updates. Um, again, high-level updates include for the actual match within the regional share, where previously this required a 50% minimum match that has been reduced down to a 20% minimum match. Uh, and of course, we've updated the project and program eligibility requirements. Um, within the sub-regional share, uh, we have updated the funding targets. Uh, funding targets indicate um, the targeted percentage that will go to each subregion or forum. And again, on the overall uh, funding that is available, 20% overall goes to the, re the regional share, 80% goes to the subregional share. Then the subregional share is further split down according to these funding targets. And of course, just like the regional share, uh, we've also updated the project and program eligibility requirements. All right, so moving into the funding programs or the funding that Dr. Cog um, has to allocate. Um, so overall, the two major um, sources of funding have not changed. Um, the first being the state multimodal options fund program. Um, the 50% match within this program has been uh, retained, uh, but certainly we believe is something important to point out. Uh, and that is with the FY22 funds and that year of funding only, um, that year of funding has been federalized. Um, it does contain Federal American Rescue Plan Act. Um, and along with those FY22 funds, in addition to being federalized instead of just being a state funding source for that year, um, there's also an obligation deadline of December 2024. 
And by the end of 2026, if you happen to receive these funds, um, your project, uh, all your billing must be in, um, essentially your project must be closed out by the end of 2026. The second major source of funding um, is federal funding. Um, and this was renewed um, as part of the um, November 15th signing of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Uh, so this covers federal fiscal year uh, 22, the current year, all the way out to 2026. The bill retained three major sources of funding that Dr. Cog is, uh, allocates, um, the CMAC program, the Transportation Alternatives Program and STBG or Surface Transportation Block Grant. There's also the introduction of one new program called the Carbon Reduction Program, um, which will act very similar to CMAC. But overall, the, the new Jobs Act um, will provide Dr. Cog an approximate 25 to 30% increase in funding over the FAST Act. So moving into how the process will actually look like for the programming of funds. Uh, but first of all, sort of overarching to this process, um, according to the currently adopted TIP policy, um, Dr. Cog conducts a waitlist project first um, with those additional FY22 funds. Um, this process is currently ongoing um, and will relate ultimately um, based on the amount of funds and projects that come off the current waitlist that will have a, re a slight reduction in the overall funds available for the upcoming fall, uh, upcoming calls. Uh, second of all, uh, we are moving into a conducting these calls using two tracks or two separate applications. Um, the first being solely using the surface transportation block grant funding. Um, the, uh, the second application or track is the air quality and multimodal track. Um, with this air quality multimodal application, we are going to be able to combine the remaining funding, funding sources, and that is mainly to help ad address and lower that 50% match requirement that is contained within those multimodal options funds. Um, so really the purpose of breaking these out into two separate applications is one, the match assistance, as just mentioned, uh, but also, as Jacob will talk about in the next agenda item, uh, we are hoping to avoid total interaction with the RTP amendment process um, that is currently ongoing. So in terms of the call sequence, um, Dr. Cog uh, will start a process here this coming Monday to conduct four calls uh, back to back. Um, the first two calls will be the regional and sub-regional call for the currently adopted 22 to 25 tip. Uh, these two calls will solely be focused on this air quality and multimodal track only. And again, that's primarily to avoid the RCP amendment process. Um, by kicking off this next Monday, we hope to conclude this process in September, and then we will go to amend um, the projects from those two calls into the currently adopted TIP. Uh, without skipping a beat, we will turn to the regional and sub-regional call for the new TIP covering uh, federal fiscal years 24 through 27. Um, so this will use both of these air quality and uh, surface transportation block, block grant tracks or applications. Um, kicking this off in September um, and looking to April of 2023 to be able to conclude those two calls and then move right into adopting a new TIP document. So just a quick highlight of the TIP applications themselves um, and, and primarily focusing on the actual scoring section. Um, this is broken down into four different sections. Um, the first being the regional impact of the project with a proposed weighting of 30%. Uh, and this you know, looks at you know, how important your particular project is or is your project solving a regional or sub-regional problem? How well does it connect to the MetroVision goals? Um, the next section deals with the MetroVision regional transportation priorities. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, this has a proposed weighting of 50%. Uh, and again, this looks at how does your project interact with safety, active transportation, air quality, multimodal mobility, freight, and regional transit. Uh, the next two sections, uh, the first being project leveraging is a carryover from the previous application with a proposed weighting of 10%. This is essentially looking at how much local match are you gonna provide with, uh, within your application beyond that required minimum. 
And finally, section D, a brand new section called project readiness with a proposed weighting of 10%. Um, and this is looking at things that applicants probably are already doing uh, in the first place, uh, essentially preparing your project to be applied and to be filling out the application. Um, looking at prioritizing those applications that have that higher likelihood to avoid project delays, um, any cost overruns associated with the project, or some of those common project pitfalls that we would normally see. The scoring section overall, um, each question will be scored from a zero to five. Um, both sections A and B do require a narrative response. Um, however, some of those questions within those first two sections do require um, additional data to be provided along with that narrative response. Finally, getting to in the anticipated funding. Um, at this time, we anticipate approximately $487 million available over 2022 to 27. Um, as I mentioned earlier with this waitlist process, um, this number will come down slightly as we program those projects from the waitlist. Um, but if we break this out into the individual calls, one through four, um, you can see them listed on your screen. And again, these first two calls solely will deal with the air quality and multimodal type projects. Um, the second call will deal with all project types that are eligible. Um, and then again, with calls two and four you see listed on the screen, those are those sub-regional calls. Those are further broken down into the individual sub-regions. So then you can notice the total amount or total anticipated amount of funding that would be available throughout those individual calls. So that concludes uh, the information I have to uh, present to you this evening. Um, happy to take any comments or questions. Otherwise, the uh, motion before you is seen on your screen here. Uh, basically move to adopt the draft policies for TIP program development document and the draft air quality multimodal and surface transportation block grant TIP applications. Thank you so much, Planner Control. That was a great presentation. Do folks have questions? And I know um, for people that this is their first meeting coming into, it's a lot to take in. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you for your patience. Um, it's okay to have questions on the process. And um, so, you know, all of us had a first Dr. Cog meeting at some point in time. Um, looks like um, Director Smith. Hello, yes, I am one of the first time participants. So uh, drinking from the fire hose, it seems here. Just a question on when you split up the two application processes, is there a significant increase in admin work in processing that too, rather than funneling it as one and splitting where it needs to split? Planner control. I would say the answer is unknown because this is the first cycle that we have actually split these two applications. Um, However, we, in, we do not anticipate um, that administratively there will be any sort of burdens. Um, instead of having, uh, we'll just have, we'll have the same number of applications before us. Um, they'll just, we'll just have to keep them separated. Director Smith, looks like that satisfied the question. Any other comments or questions from folks? And people are welcome to make a motion to frame the discussion. And like I say, we can always amend a motion or make a substitute motion if the discussion leads us elsewhere. Anyone like to make a motion to frame the discussion? Director Coombs. Move to adopt the draft policies for TIP program development document and the draft air quality multimodal and STBG TIP applications. Thank you, Director Starker. Is there a second? I second the motion. Any discussion of the motion or other comments or questions? I'd just like to take a moment to thank um, the Transportation and Planning Department for their work on this. These things are complicated and they do a lot of outreach to our staff back in our hometowns and our counties and jurisdictions. So um, thank you for all that effort and work and incorporating the feedback you received to make the, the program better. Um, and I see um, Commissioner and Director Odoricio saying way to go staff as well. Any last chance for questions on this one tonight? All right, seeing no other comments or questions, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. Any abstentions? Thank you, everyone. The motion carries. And that takes us. Um,
to our informational briefing portion of the meeting. So the 2050 regional- Madam, Madam Chair. Yes, Dr. If I may, I, I think we're planning on doing the addendum now, seeing that's an action item. Oh, I'm sorry. You know what? I have the addendum pulled up in a separate window. So of course, I'm just reading along this screen. Um, thank you very much. And so we'll take up the addendum as the action item in this section of the meeting. So for folks who downloaded the packet early, there's a second addendum that gets sent to everyone um, on these legislative items. And so it should have been emailed to you. And then you'll find it on the website under the calendar. You'll be able to find the addendum and click on it. And so we're going to be um, discussing state and legislative issues and new bills for consideration and action. And so I'm going to turn it over to our executive director first, just to describe this process to everybody, because it's a little bit different than some of the other actions we take. And sometimes the material we receive comes a little bit later than the packet. So he'll take us through the process. Executive Director Rex. Thank you, Madam Chair, very much. And yes, really for the new members, uh, folks that have been on the board uh, through last legislative session knows how hectic it, uh, events could be when it's, as we talk about a legislative or, or, or um, um, but we talk about legislation, but uh, so typically, as you as you know, the, the 2022 session started on um, uh, last Wednesday, January 12th, which is the same day as we send out our board agenda packet for this evening. Um, and Rich Morrow, who you'll hear from here in a minute, he he uh, um, you know quickly runs through and 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 checks the bills to see which ones might be appropriate for Dr. Cog to take a position or have a conversation about. Um, and normally you'll see as we go forth in, in, at the February meeting, there will be obviously more time and Rich will include um, a number of additional bills if they're introduced that might have relevance to Dr. Cog. But we do reserve the, the, um, uh, the right pursuant to a board policy that was, that, that was adopted several years ago that um, new bills that are released after the packet goes out at the, our board packet goes out that you know, within, you know, within 48 hours of the board meeting, we will send you additional bills as an addendum. So that's why you're seeing it like you're seeing it today. So I, I, you know, I truly, you know, it's, it's, it's just one of those calendar schedule types things, right? I apologize that it's, uh, you're not, you know, you only had a couple of days to look at this and I'm sure uh, a lot of councils probably had an opportunity to take these up, but so you know, with regards to what we do as, as a board, um, we will provide, uh, you all uh, a staff recommendation on proposed bills that we believe are, are relevant to Dr. Cog. Um, and typically we take uh, staff recommended positions of support, oppose, monitor. Um, there are some that we just straight up um, just ask for your opinion and get your direction on, on bills. And we have one of those this evening for, for your consideration. Um, and if we do take a, a, a position on the bill, we, the board, um, it requires a vote, a positive vote of two thirds of those president voting. So, um, so it's a pretty, pretty big threshold for us, but uh, we just wanted, I wanted to make sure you guys were all aware of that. And Madam Chair, I don't know if you had anything further you would like to say before we introduce Rich. Thank you, I'll just add a few other things. Um, so this, uh, the Dr. Cog staff uses the legislative agenda that the board has approved to help them guide what, what bills to bring forward. So they're within, usually within the scope of aging, which were the area agency on aging for the region or transportation. Those are the main focus areas. But we have a pretty collegial policy where um, if members wanna bring forward a, a topic that they think is of regional importance to this board and they think the board will wanna talk about, they can bring it forward as a suggestion and the board can determine whether staff should you know, continue to monitor or whatnot. So we can bring up other bills as individual members to recommend the group look at um, and just find out if there is interest from the group. Um, in the two thirds voting, I just wanna clarify that if, if um, what happens from time to time is um, some boards haven't taken a position yet, so their members will just choose to abstain. And so that two thirds number is of the group of people that is actively voting. So let's say, you know, the majority, let's say half of the people here abstain, we'll have to recalculate what two thirds of the remaining present people are out of the abstentions, just to clarify that piece of it. So sometimes Melinda is doing math for me very, very quickly and we're text messaging back and forth. So I'll try to keep you posted on all the math that's happening behind the scenes. And then I'll say this, each jurisdiction seems to handle this process a little bit differently. And that's because we all have different forms of government or maybe different relationships. So, you know, in Louisville, we have a legislative policy that we set as a group. 
Um, and then we give each other some latitude to stay within the policy and take action on things. Other jurisdictions explicitly want to vote as a group on each item before they have members take a vote. Um, and so everybody needs to be comfortable with where they are. And I'll just say this, as a group, we have a lot of um, credibility. So if there are things that we think are really important to Colorado or the region, it is important that we can find a way to work together um, and take a position on it. So if there are things that are just of such critical importance, um, but maybe your group's not quite there yet, sometimes members choose to abstain on those topics. So the rest of the group can take a position and advocate for something because it really does mean something if the Denver Regional Council of Governments as a group takes a position. So it's complicated. Um, I know this is a lot of people's first meetings. And what I'll say is the good news is I don't think we're really in a corner where we have, have, have to take action on any of these tonight. So um, it's a good, it's a good start for us, but I'll turn it over to our excellent lobbyists to tell us, well, first I'll turn it over to Rich to introduce the topic for us even more. Rich. I thought you were speak. referring to me. No. I am, I am Rich. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and, and, and I will introduce uh, in a minute uh, our contract lobbyist, but I did wanna add that um, one of the reasons why we have this process um, for bringing bills to you that get introduced after the board agenda goes out is, is largely a timing issue that uh, the board meets monthly. So if we don't take position uh, on a bill, at a board meeting, then we have to wait for the next month in order to have an official position. And that sometimes can constrain the work that we do uh, on your behalf at the Capitol. Um, but there are certainly times when um, the board's comfort level outweighs that. Uh, but I did wanna add that that in. Um, and and the, other, the other thing is that, um, the uh, the bill the the one bill uh, to the directors uh, or the chair's last comment that um, there is the first bill we're going to talk about actually already has been calendared um, and it's going to be heard uh, on February fourth so there's a little bit more urgency. Oh, thank you that for that one. correction, Rich. Sure, no, that's fine, and 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 I think most of you know how um, uncertain legislative process is. Uh, one minute you haven't heard anything for a bill about a bill in, in, in weeks and then all of a sudden you hear that it's calendared three days from now and so you know we just deal with with those sort of things as we move along um, and so be right before we get into the bills I just wanted to take one moment to introduce uh, Jennifer Castle and Ed Bowditch who've been Dr. Cog's uh, contract lobbyist for several years now they're on the on the call so they're available to answer questions if, if I'm unable to as we go through this. Um, and, but I wanted to make sure that you knew that, that they were here tonight and uh, ready to participate if needed. So with that, um, I will call your attention to the first bill, um, which is uh, House Bill 1035, that's being called the Modernization of the Older Coloradans Act. And uh, just as a quick uh, background, the Older Coloradans Act is a state statute that uh, more or less parallel, uh, parallels the federal Older Americans Act. And so it establishes the state uh, laws regarding the uh, operation of uh, um, the area agencies on aging of which Dr. Cog is one and our relationship with uh, the State Department of Human Services. And um, it also includes the uh, Colorado Commission on Aging and I believe the Ombudsman program is dealt with in that statute. Um, what is being contemplated in this bill is, uh, uh, ha is, is largely pretty close to um, changes that many of us, um, and, and I, I think it's fair to say Dr. Cog has been in the forefront of advocating for many of these changes over the years to, uh, to, for the state to become more proactive and, and more of an advocate uh, for older Coloradans. 
and um, there's always going to be, you know, programmatic requirements and um, that to run these various programs and services. Uh, but um, many of us have have wanted the department to be much more of a partner in pursuing innovation and um, making changes to prepare the state for the uh, accelerating aging of our population. And, um, and which is one of the reasons why uh, we worked really hard six years ago to, to create the strategic action planning group on aging um, to do that sort of strategic planning that the state really wasn't. Um, this bill um, is also partly related to uh, SAPCA as we call it, um, sunsetting at the end of this year. Uh, after six years, it is produced um, numerous recommendations and a, and a master or strategic plan on aging. And some of that uh, uh, is getting incorporated into these state statutes um, in terms of uh, representation uh, on the uh, Commission on Aging, for instance. Uh, it had, uh, in current statute, the membership, I, I believe, is two members from each of the congressional districts, and that's it. Uh, SAPCA's membership was much broader in terms of having representation from uh, uh, community providers, uh, aging advocates, uh, AAAs, uh, and so forth. And so a number of that, that kind of uh, representation is going to be added to the Commission on Aging, and its, its duties and authorities are going to be uh, enhanced over its largely just uh, advisory role currently. Um, and then I think the other major uh, thing that will be added to this statutes in this bill is uh, uh, putting lifelong Colorado in statutes and under the <clears throat> Department of Health and Human Services. Um, lifelong Colorado is the state's age-friendly communities program, uh, somewhat <laughs> similar to Dr. Cog's Boomer Bond. And in fact, it was created and in, in established in 19 or 2017, uh, along with the governor's office and AARP Colorado and Dr. Cog as partners in establishing it. But the state has struggled to really develop it and fund it up until now. And so now they're prepared to make a commitment for it and that's incorporated in the bill. Uh, so anyway, with all of those reasons and, and, and the last reason that um, there's been a lot of stakeholding from the, from the governor's office and the department on this bill uh, since last fall. And uh, Jayla and myself and, and the others in the aging community have been uh, involved in, in that stakeholding and in, in commenting on various drafts of the bill. So with that, that's one that we, um, we strongly recommend that the board support. The reason why I put with amendments though, is that with, with a lot of these kinds of bills, particularly one that is gonna be really important uh, change going forward, um, there's still a, a few questions uh, in, <clears throat> on, on some of the language on how precise the language is and the intent. And so there's ongoing conversations. And in fact, a couple of meetings that I'm gonna be in uh, later this week on uh, discussing amendments and so forth. And so uh, we just wanted to leave open the possibility that we, we want to support the bill, but still have the uh, ability to support amendments to improve it going forward. Thank you very much, Rich. Great um, explanation. Do people have questions um, for Rich on this bill? And we'll take them up one at a time. So the staff recommendation is to support the bill with amendments and um, per Rich's correction, this one is time sensitive. Um, so if we want to have our staff lobby on this one, we would need to take a position on it tonight. Um, not seeing any hands with any questions, do people have um, feelings they would like to share with the group about whether or not to take a position of support with amendments or a different position? Um, Director Starker. I would make a motion that we support this uh, uh, HB 1035 with uh, amendments. Second. Good bill. Uh, thank you. And Paul, did you want to, uh, Director Cosman, did you want to speak to the, to the motion or discuss it in any way? Well, I'm good with it just being seconded and supporting it. Thank you. Any other discussion from folks? Director Odoricio? 
Yeah, my apologies. What's the what's the um, if we need to recuse ourselves, our board has not voted on this yet. So what I'm going to do on all of these um, is I'll ask for abstentions first. Actually, I know that's a little bit um, not the way that we always do things. But if I get abstentions first, then I can quickly do the math on how many we need to vote mm -hmm. in support. <laughs> So, um, and it's, I understand if folks need to abstain. And what I just ask is if you are abstaining, if you could raise your virtual hand by clicking the raise hand button at the bottom of the screen. And if you can't raise your hand that way, just go ahead and raise your hand and I'll see it that way. One, two, so I see. I'm just let, letting people find a chance to find that button. And um, Director Pulowski, I see your hand. And we're clear, it's it's not a problem with the bill or even the staff position. It's sure. just that our team has not made a position on it. Right. No, and no problem at all. Thank you, Director Mauricio, okay. right. for clarifying that. Same, same with me. One, two, three, four. All right, so we have eight um, abstentions on this one. If you could all put your hands down. All those in favor of the motion, please, if you can raise your virtual hand, it helps us to count it faster. All right, and then go ahead and put your virtual hands down. This is really good. After two years of being electronically on Zoom, everybody is so good at this. <laughs> Thank you. And then all those opposed to taking the position of support with amendments, please raise your virtual hand if you're opposed. All right. Thank you, everyone. The motion carries. Um, so we are going to take a position of support with amendments. Rich, would you like to tell us about the next bill? Uh, sure. Thank you. Um, so the next bill is 10, House Bill 1026, and it uh, replaces an existing income tax deduction uh, for employer-provided uh, alternative transportation options with an income tax credit. And um, I might uh, add as well that in making, uh, in identifying bills to present to you and in and, and what position or to recommend to you. Uh, I work with the, uh, our, our lobbyists first to identify bills and then um, share those with the appropriate Dr. Cog staff, in this case, uh, Ron Papsdorf and, 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 and uh, Doug Rex, uh, to see if, if this is a bill that we should take a position on and what position that should be. So this, this uh, recommendation ref reflects that that process as well. And I don't know if there's, um, uh, and so I'm not necessarily the expert on this one. So if there's any other questions, maybe I'll ask for Doug or Ron to answer them. Um, I'll turn it over um, to Director Papstorf if you wanted to add anything. <coughs> or Executive Director Rex, if you wanted to add anything. Actually, did and I course, see? And of course, this is the bill that, that someone uh, testified on before at the beginning of the meeting. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, no, Rich. I think I think no, this not. is not this is not. Oh, it's the one. next one. I'm sorry. I'm jumping ahead already. I'm already thinking ahead. Sorry. Thanks for correcting me. <laughs> this is this this is the bill that um, that replaces an existing income tax deduction That's for right. um, business for employers that provide alternative transportation and uh, replacing that with a refundable income tax credit. I don't have a lot more detail to add. Yeah, no, ma so Madam Chair, I might just mention that, you know, the reason we felt comfortable with the staff recommendation that we are is that, you know, it's um, obviously uh, part of the, our programming associated to with transportation demand management and the importance of, um, you know, trying to reduce the single occupancy vehicle use within our region, which is a stated target and goal of our Metro Vision plan. Um, and I think we felt comfortable with, with the recommendation simply because there's, um, it's an incentive program and not necessarily a mandate, which I know we would have to have further conversation about. Um, so it's, it's really truly an incentive for employers to, uh, to pursue some options. It looks like we have some questions or comments from members. Director Mulvey? Yeah, thank you. Um, we're just, I got a little confused when you were talking about which one. This is HB 1026, right? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so my 
as a clarifying question and then a follow-up will be there. This is a tax credit to the employer, right? Employer. Correct. Yep. So as a follow-up, and this is informational, don't know if it's too much detail or granular, but I'm fully supportive of employers who provide incentives for alternative transportation. What concerns me is whether or not there's a distinction for vulnerable workers or low-income workers who can't use those alternative forms because they need to bring their children to daycare or school. And it, it, to me, it's an issue that is often overlooked when we're looking for these solutions to incentivize non-vehicle use. If, is there any consideration or discussion about differentiating whether or not this employer who might receive this credit would provide alternative transportation that would allow these parents to bring their children to school or work nearby. And to be specific, most parents need to bring a child at a certain time to a school with a bag and a lunch bag. And you can't always use a train or a bicycle or other alternative modalities for that. So, are we saying that an employer who has 10 or 100 employees who can ride the bus because they don't have children to worry about will get this tax credit even though a small fraction of their workforce would actually be using it? Thus, the, the, the actual purpose of this tax credit is not achieved. Is there any discussion about that? I'll turn it over to our policy analyst, Rich Morrow, for that. Rich? Oh, I'm not the one to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> it might be just an I don't know. I'm or just yes being or no. honest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it, uh, Madam Chair, if I may. Start. Executive Director yeah. Um, I, I think you raised some some really they, interesting they questions are, they associated are really with good this. Questions. Yeah. And uh, you know, and and, and I, I truly do not know. But I, I think we will, I think these are, this is probably areas we can explore as this bill moves further along Absolutely. in the process. Um to see. And I know Ed and Jen are on the line too. I don't know if they have any additional comments that they might know something that I don't, but um I very good comments. Um, and so I'll just give a chance for, it looks like Ed Bowditch, our lobbyist, has wants to make some comments. And Jen, you'll have an opportunity to, too, if you'd like. Yes, Jen just texted me, reminding me that this bill, uh, good evening, everybody, Ed Bowditch, lobbyist. This bill did come out of an interim committee, so it already has had a certain level of vetting. And what they're trying to do is take a tax deduction that really wasn't being used for employers and roll it into a tax credit that will be used. It will still cost a business money if a business wants to, for example, get eco passes for all of its employees. It will still cost that business money, but there's an incentive for them to do it, a tax credit. Now, whether the individual employees use it will depend on their individual situation. But there wasn't any discussion along the, the issues that, that you raised about types of employees who may have to make multiple stops, whether it's with children or whatever, um, or even frankly, people who don't live convenient to multimodal options. But that was the thought to roll it from a non-used deduction to a, a credit that would be much more likely. And this year, as the state is in a $1.9 billion Tabor refund, establishing a tax credit doesn't take any money away from any other state operating programs. It looks like um, Ron Papsdorf in transportation um, would like to make some comments too, so we'll let him have a chance. I, I just wanted to note that it's it's not just about transit passes. It is also about subsidized ride sharing and other things that might provide additional flexibility for some employers that may not have direct access to transit per se, but other alternative modes might be might be a viable option. And again, the business only gets the track tax credit to the you know if they're actually providing the these incentives um, to to use these alternative travel modes. Director Mulvey. Thank you. I I have to, with respect, say that it doesn't quite address the concern because, um, but that's more or more of a comment. But thank you for giving me the information available. Thank you very much. Next, we have Director Spear. 
Thank you. Um, I just wanted to uh, give a report from SCR in Boulder. Um, we are quite excited um, about this bill as it's emerging. Um, we had a couple of things though that um, we thought could be improvements to just make it a little bit better for um, cities you know, that, that already have a lot of employers that are taking advantage of, of these options. Um, one is to expand the list of qualifying alternative transportation options um, so that they would include things like bike share or micro mobility um, memberships and subsidies for bike purchases. Um, as it's written, the bill is mostly limited to transit and rideshare benefits at the moment. Um, we have a lot of neat micro mobility programs um, here in Boulder, like the B Cycle program. Um, I think Denver has this as well, um, and some other cities uh, that really. Um, have been increasing the number of uh, ways that people are getting around that are not single occupancy vehicles, or I'm sorry, decreasing <laughs> the, the number of single occupancy vehicle trips. Um, the other thing that we were really interested in uh, tweaking on this, this bill, um, just to raise it with this group, um, is that we do have some special districts in our uh, community um, that are basically a way for smaller employers to participate in these programs kind of by pooling uh, resources together. Um, as written, the bill would only benefit companies that provide these programs directly. And so one uh, change that we would love to see in this um, is that these uh, transportation or these um, business districts could take advantage of this tax credit as well, as we, we do have a few in Boulder that are uh, using it this way. Thank you, Director Spear. And it looked like I had a hand from Director Conklin, but it may have gotten put down. No? Put down. Um, yep. All right, just making sure. And then just so folks know, um, we do have the chat activated, but if people want to participate in the conversation, it's best if you raise your hand and speak, um, just because you know some people may be participating in different ways where they don't have access to the chat. Um, so there is not a motion on the table. Um, it does seem like there's some mixed thought around this. Maybe support with amendments came up, maybe monitor came up. So um, I'm having a hard time gauging the group from the comments just that we've received so far. So I do think someone will need to make a motion for us to be able to take action. Director Mulvey. I would move to support the bill with amendments if if it can be distinguished that the intention is realized to the based on the actual worker use, which is, you know, to and then reducing the traffic. So the motion is that that was a very bad motion. No, um, so I'll try to some I'll try to capture it and then you'll tell me if I've done it right. Yeah. So the I, the idea um, would be to take a position of support with amendments. Um, and to try to and to try to um, give guidance to the bill sponsors that we really want to see benefits to employees out of this at the end of the day, and then to also incorporate Director Spears comments around micro mobility and some of the other special districts. Sorry, Dur no, I, I, I didn't actually, I didn't actually um, make a motion with respect to um, Director Spears comments. Um, my, my motion is to support with amendments to ensure that, uh, why don't I withdraw my motion and rephrase it please, to support it with amendments to ensure that all needed transportation is covered by anyone receiving the tax credit. Thank you, is there a second? Um, Director Spear? You're on mute, but I. Thank you. Sorry, it's been a long day. My daughter broke her arm this morning, slipping in uh, the ice. And so anyway, oh, a no, of no, today, so I apologize. Um, I, I just, I think I'm not quite clear on um, Director Mul Mulvey's um, comment there in terms of all transportation options. And I just wanted to make sure that, um, you know, this incorporates um, the, the um, issues around some of the um, districts, as well as the micro mobility options, um, potentially even things like um, subsidies for electric bicycles. Director Mulvey. Yes, by saying all needed transportation, uh, that was intended to incorporate both my comments and Director Spears. Thank you. And so I just want to, but um, so Director Spear, did you want to second the motion? Yes. Yeah, I'll second that. Thank you. 
Great, great. There's a motion and a second uh, to support with amendments. And Director Mulvey, will you please just repeat it as you phrased it so that I get it right? I should have written it down. <laughs> <laughs> and it looked like motion we may... to support. The motion is to support the bill with amendments to ensure that all of the needed transportation is provided for and the tax credit is only provided for that needed transportation. Thank you, Director Mulvey. And then I just wanna check in um, with Rich to make sure staff understands the spirit of the motion and can implement it for us. Yes, I think we got it. Yes, thank you. All right. And I just wanna check in with the directors and make sure everyone's clear on what we're voting on. All right, perfect. Thank you everybody for the discussion. And so again, I'm just gonna put everybody's hand down for just one minute. And then I'd ask if there are abstentions on the motion to support as amended. Um, please raise your hand now if you have an abstention on taking a position. I see, I'm just checking through the screens in case people cannot raise their virtual hand. All right, very good. So I see 11 abstentions, thank you. And so we'll put those hands down. <clears throat> this is excellent. And so now um, all those in favor of the motion to support with amendments, please raise your hand. 16, 17, 18, 19, very good. So we're at the threshold. Thank you if you'll put your hands down. And just a couple more. Sorry about the delay. Thank you. And then all those opposed, please raise your virtual hands. All right. Thank you, everyone. The motion carries to support with amendments. And that takes us to our next bill. All right. So the next one, this is the one that was mentioned earlier in the meeting. Uh, so I probably don't need to say a whole lot more about it, um, but uh, we did uh, recognize it as uh, an issue that it, it definitely relates to Dr. Cog's work and uh, policies that the board has adopted in the past, but we also recognize that, um, you know, it does address, uh, I think, the state versus local control issues potentially. And so we wanted to uh, not presume a position at this point. So we're asking for board direction. Uh, if you have a better handle on the impacts to local governments, um, we'd be happy to hear that. We're also uh, obviously will be following this bill and engaging uh, the stakeholders in this. Um, one of the things I will add at this time is uh, we also always endeavor to check with our other local government partners like uh, Colorado Municipality, Colorado Counties, uh, CCAT, and so forth uh, for positions to, to see uh, how they're viewing various bills. And in this case, because the session just ended, none of them have, uh, that I've been able to find have, a, have uh, had a chance to take positions yet. So don't have anything to add in that. Thank you. Um, so discussion from members, Director Kraftart. Thank you. So um, really appreciate you bringing this bill. Uh, at Jefferson County, we have talked about this policy and we decided to not do it locally because it would be so confusing for people if it was just the county and not the municipalities and not other counties and not other municipalities. So having a statewide policy, I think, and we talked about is a good thing. One of the things I would like to see in this is an education piece. Because as somebody who is a bit older, it is confusing to me when you see these bikes flip through the uh, stop signs and you are not anticipating it, um, I think we need to do have some education, whether that is, um, like in the past, they've put paper, you know, flyers in with your driver's notices, um, you know, social media. Um, so it doesn't have to be expensive education, but I think there needs to be um, 
uh, some uh, a requirement here that there's some education. Thank you. Thank you, Director Krafthar. Next, Director Mauer. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just have concern with this bill, and um, it's just I, I look at it like today, if many times a bicyclist will go ahead and do just this, knowing that they are taking the risk on when they are crossing it. And of course, that is kind of how they relay this bill anyway, that they're taking the risk. However, I look at it as if there is an accident, uh, a vehicle, bicycle conflict, then how do you decide who had the right of way? And I, that is the only place that I have the concern with this. Thank you. Thank you, um, Director Sierra. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so Madam Chair, uh, Inglewood is actually one of the cities that has already passed the safety stop. We passed it back when we re rewrote the uh, traffic code back in 2020. So we have uh, going about 13, 14 months now with this passing. And this actually was a pretty long, arduous process. Internally, we worked with our transportation advisory committee on this for a couple of years. Uh, also additional stakeholders within the city, such as the police department and public works. And without, um, and since then, we haven't really seen any negative impacts to moving to the safety stop. And one of the reasons why we moved forward with this is that obviously we are trying to make our city more walkable. So we wanna make it safe for everyone, pedestrians, cyclists, um, and vehicles to you know, move around the city. And so we saw this as an easy way to do it without really adding a budget line item to our uh, city budget. So ultimately what we kind of decided was if we decided to stay with the status quo, we were basically gonna treat the road, uh, the rules of the road the same, regardless of whether you're a 4,000 pound vehicle or a cyclist or a pedestrian. And we all know if there is an accident, you know, those aren't the same. So ultimately we, we saw this as a good thing. As I stated, we haven't seen any negative impacts. So at least from what we've seen in Inglewood and there's other municipalities within the state of Colorado that have done this and haven't seen much impact. Uh, I do see this as something that I would like to see our board support uh, tonight. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Director Sierra. Director Wheelock. Yeah, I, uh, uh, it, it, this is a weird one for me to have concerns about having ridden thousands of miles a year and raced and always advocated for the ability to do something like this. I do have a concern because uh, at, it, we, as we achieve a higher usage of these kinds of vehicles and bicycles and e-bikes, uh, there are, and I'm trying, not trying to be a snob about it, but there are a lot of people who approaching an intersection at 15 miles an hour, if that's the only speed they need to slow to at 15 miles an hour, the time to assess the, both directions and understand and make sure whether you're dealing with a two-way or a four-way stop in a situation like that is, is um, difficult for a person of limited experience and uh, at that speed and um, difficult if you're in an area that you're not familiar with so that you don't know the route as well. And so one of my only concerns, and I've expressed this to some other folks that have been in favor of the bill, is I, I like the idea a lot. I wish it were sitting at five to 10 miles per hour just based on reaction times. Of course, I'm 73 years old, so my reactions aren't what they used to be, but I was down a black diamond slope just two days ago. So I can still react a little bit, but I, uh, I just wanna say that, that I'm, you know, I'm probably gonna end up supporting this at the end of the day. Um, but I do have concerns about that particular speed. Thank you, Director Wheelock. Director Mulvey? Thank you. I echo the safety concerns. Um, and while it might make sense in an ultra urban environment, in what planners still call urban, but isn't urban in the city sense, it might not work per, primarily for what Director Wheelock said. Um, and then also, I echo the concerns about liability having handled countless pedestrian, um, bicycle, and auto cases in my career. Um, there are serious cases, and who needs to pay for those injuries when it's really always going to be a tragic result when you have an auto or a truck versus a human on a small bicycle. It's asking for a problem. But more practically, my biggest concern is that it doesn't account for the parts of our Denver metro region that have unincorporated areas. So if one municipality is looking to 
um, adopt this and another municipality might not, the unincorporated area isn't covered unless the county decides to do it. So when we're looking to enhance multi-modalities multi and especially allow for someone who is say in Castle Rock going up to the RTD and Lone Tree by bike where we have a terrific um, part of that is already planned, how would we ensure that somebody speeding along a higher speed road is gonna know about this? And how are we gonna ensure that it's the same all across and that people know, wait, I have to do this in this town and that in that town. It's precisely the same reason why folks want a mask mandate <laughs> all over. So it's, it's a matter of thinking it through. Um, I have these major concerns about it, so I would, support going back to perhaps the drafters and the sponsors to find out if these are things that could be incorporated. I just, I'm not, I'm not seeing it. Director Mulvey, and I'm just a little confused. So I just wonder if I can get some clarification mm -hmm. from um, Rich on this one. Um, so my understanding is right now, it's the fragmented approach in the state where different communities can have different approaches and this bill is to adopt a statewide standard. Is that correct? That's my understanding, yes. So, so basically allowing somebody to stop and go no matter what the road surface looks like is still a problem. So I'll obviously withdraw the issue with, with that misunderstanding of mine, but I'm still not seeing how if you're going from, you know, more urban to through a rural area to somewhere, how that would help and what the concern is. I'm, I'm thinking of Hess Road for all of us in Douglas County. We've had people die there. Thank how you. Does, thanks. Thank you, Director Mulvey. Director Hassan? It, it's Hazeman. Uh, oh, I'm sorry about that. Director that's Hazeman. okay, that's okay. Being a new guy, I'm, I'm uh, subject to mispronunciation, which is fine. So I do support this bill. I think as we talk multimodal that we should be trying to encourage more use of, of uh, bicycles. And the idea that it's a yield sign, it doesn't uh, mean that a person's not gonna take a look to see what's going on. They're not gonna just have the freedom to pass through a, a stop sign. And even with a stop light, they're a stop. They're not to proceed without. So I'm, I think that it's a good idea and I'm pleased that the cities that have already adopted it are found to be successful. So I'm in, in, uh, in favor of it as is the Commissioner Karp, uh, Kraft Tharp and I'm agreeing that we ought to also be sure that we understand the educational side of it and that yeah. people need yeah. to be taught what it all means. Thank you. Thank you, Director Shaw. Thank you very much. I also speak in favor of support of this. Um, I, like uh, Director Kraft Tharp, um, uh, feel like this patchwork approach, you know, Aspen, Englewood, Berthoud, um, um, and some of uh, Thornton, and some of the other towns that have adopted this. Uh, and I believe Summit County, um, you, when you want, run the risk of some people not uh, uh, following the rules in a patchwork. And so by making this a statewide thing, um, it is at least a consistent traffic rule. Um, in staff comments, it also references that the bicycle or low speed vehicle um, um, still needs to yield to other traffic. So it, they, they have permission to do these things provided uh, you know, the road is clear and the way is safe. So I, I would support this and again, I, I echo the comment about education because it is um, disconcerting as a driver to see a bicycle just go flying through a uh, four-way stop um, unless you understand they're actually allowed to do that. So um, my comments. Thank you, Director Shaw. Director Vedham. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. So the uh, the words that I, I have fixated on here is low speed conveyance. Okay, so from my reading of the text, it opens the uh, door well beyond bicycles. So, uh, for example, a person that has an electric bicycle could easily claim he's, he has a low speed conveyance. I, I don't know technically what these things are called, but I see these guys downtown with rented what I'll call electric skateboards. Uh, when I'm downtown at night, I see people that are obviously have a death wish <laughs> because they're on these uh, rented electric skateboards blow right through a red light, right through traffic. So uh, passage, uh, 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 support of this bill, I think it would be very convenient for lots of people. My fear is that it would also um, create an environment where, where lots of people are gonna be injured or killed. And uh, so, uh, Putting uh, people's lives uh, ahead of convenience, I will not be able to support this. Thank you. Thank you, Director Vidham. Director Spear. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to echo a couple of the other comments. Um, and so we, uh, Boulder, we're still doing some research on this, so we don't um, have a position yet. I suspect we will likely um, go towards supporting uh, if that aligns with um, the county and, and some other folks. Um, but I just wanted to bring up a couple of things. Um, one is that I believe most of the data, at least that we've found so far, um, suggests that there are reductions in accidents and deaths um, at intersections uh, to bicyclists when laws like this are put in place. Um, my understanding of why that's the case is because um, if you're kind of having to stop at the intersection, you're spending, as a cyclist, spending more time um, in that space, which then kind of poses more of a risk. So it just moves people through uh, the intersection faster. And I completely understand some of the right of way issues. I was concerned about that myself um, at first, but um, I believe with this bill, uh, the way that it will work is that the, the cyclists still have to follow the um, in initial right of way. So if there are cars stopped at the intersection, um, you can't just fly past those cars uh, on a bike, you would have to kind of stop and wait your turn. It would really only be if there are no um, other, you know, vehicles present um, that you would have the ability to, to do this. Uh, so you can't change the right of way, um, I believe with this bill. Um, the other thing I wanted to bring up that I haven't heard anybody mention yet um, is that in terms of tickets that are given out to cyclists, um, most communities that have looked at this find a significant racial bias um, in who is getting those tickets. And so I think uh, there, there's also some um, equity gains in um, this type of law, just simply reducing uh, the, the tickets um, and therefore re uh, reducing the bias um, that currently exists in, in many places that have um, these laws in place. Uh, I was also um, taken by uh, Director Sierra's comments that um, they did not notice any uh, increase in um, crashes or safety concerns or anything uh, after the law was put in place. So thank you for sharing that information. Thank you, Director Spear. Director Lundstedt. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I couldn't say it any better than uh, many of my previous directors. Um, I just wanted to uh, echo um, what was just said that there's there, the other states that have done this uh, saw reductions in um, bicycle accidents in intersections. So I think this is a great uh, piece of legislation. I think the the, the state standard makes a lot of sense. And um, I really like Director Krepthorpe's emphasis on uh, education. So I, I would encourage my fellow directors uh, to support this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Director Lindstedt. And um, I just will add the city of Louisville's position. The city of Louisville has taken a position of support on this topic. Um, and for all, it pretty much exactly the reasons that Director Kraft Tharp listed, so I won't repeat those, but she put it perfectly to our point. It's very hard to tell when you leave one community and enter the next. Um, we're a metropolitan area, and so if we have different traffic regulations in our communities, there's very little chance people will adhere to them when they don't even know what community that they're in. Um, and then I'll just add sort of an anecdote. Um, when I was learning to drive, I've always been kind of a weirdo and a rule follower. 
um, which is maybe obvious, obviously stated. Um, but I grew up in the mountains and I was learning to drive on I-70 by the runway truck ramp, you know, and things like that. And it says clearly on it, like trucks only. And so I asked my mom who was teaching me how to drive at the time, like, well, what if my vehicle runs away and I use one of these facilities? What's, what will happen? What's the penalty? And she's, it doesn't matter. Like, let's say you get a ticket, but you saved your life. It's worth doing. You just break that law and you'll get a ticket. It's no big deal, which was terrifying to me. Like I hated the idea that I wouldn't follow the rule of like truck only and the runaway truck ramp. And so from my perspective, if we have laws that people need to break to save their lives, those are probably not good laws. And so you have cyclists today that are breaking this rule for their own life and safety. And they're probably making the right ethical or moral choice. But then the question is like, well, why wouldn't the laws align with that? Um, so I think that this really does create a safety incentive and it makes it so that our laws like more consistently align with the reality of what's happening and what people need to do to be safe and protected. So thank you. Any other comments on this one? Director Lance. I'm so sorry. I, I try to save my comments for last and I just had not seen the hands up on the people with their video off. So I apologize for going ahead of you. Thank Director. you. Um, I'm going to vote to oppose this. Uh, as we've all seen, we, we've all seen and we've probably all been good bikers and, and bad bikers too. Uh, but we had a discussion with the, on this. Uh, our police department highlighted several cases where there were injuries uh, that took place. And uh, we, we just don't want to take the chance of people being injured and somebody dying over or something like this by saving uh, a little bit of time going, not stopping at a a uh, stop sign or a stop light. Thank you. Thank you, Director Cockrell. Um, I wanna say that there were so many great comments about this, so I don't have a lot to add. Um, in general, I'm very supportive of this with respect to cyclists. I think uh, Director Vidham brought up a very good point that as written, this includes all low speed conveyances, not just cyclists. And we keep framing the discussion in terms of it only applying to cyclists. Um, I wonder if there isn't a way that we could uh, specify that as far as statewide, this applies only for cyclists. And if municipalities want to include low speed mm -hmm. conveyances as an expansion, that that might be more appropriate decision at an individual municipality level. But I'm in complete agreement that this would be excellent legislation as applicable to cyclists only. Thank you. Thank you, Director Cockrell. Director Coombs. Um, yeah, thank you. And thank you to everyone for your comments in general. I do want to make sure we're all very, very clear that the purpose of this is safety, that it's not convenience. It's not about it's hard to stop at a light and takes some extra time, but that actually going through a light when it is safe to do so, when there are not other vehicles in that intersection is safer for cyclists than it is to stop, have all the traffic build up alongside you and around you, and then to be going alongside vehicles when you could be going through the intersection. <clears throat> and avoiding vehicles. And so that's really the purpose is to give people more opportunities to avoid vehicles and keep themselves safe. Certainly education is clearly very important on this issue, making sure that people know that you don't get the right of way just because this law has passed, that you still have to obey right of way rules. But as long as you're doing that, you can go through when there is a red light. So absolutely support the education piece, but I do want to make sure that we're all very clear that this is about safety and actually saving lives, not merely about convenience. Thank you, Director Coombs. Director Starker. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. We, we have a, a very active bicycle riding community in Wheat Ridge. I had two groups um, reach out to me today. You know, when I, when I look at this, uh, they, they have uh, data that shows that it reduces crashes in intersections and provides more visibility for bicyclists. Um, 
you know, the other the other thing about this bill is it makes it uh, a, a mixed uh, a mixed uh, legislation of both local and state control. So we would get some uniformity out of the out of the legislation. Uh, with I believe I, I took a look at the brief look at the legislation this afternoon, uh, an opportunity for local communities to have their uh, their own inputs in it. I agree with Director. Uh, Wheelock, I believe that it seems like the speed limits were a little bit higher than I would uh, I would have thought. I think it's good that it that it makes it incumbent upon the uh, the bicycle rider uh, in that community to uh, to follow the the right of way of the law, and and I also think it's going to encourage additional uh, educational efforts as uh, director. Um, Oh gosh, and the name I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, uh, Kraft Tharp uh, brought up. I think that's great. Make your problem, but <laughs> you know <laughs> I, I got it in the end. <laughs> that good enough, but <laughs> and uh, and I I also think it will. Um, there's a lot more uh, sort of micro mobility options that are coming online that that we haven't seen you know i didn't see any of these things you know i had a two-wheel bicycle when i was a kid and that uh, that was right after the three-wheel tricycle and that was as far as i got in you know in the sophistication and now we have a whole range of sort of these micro mobility uh, options i think this is an entree into being able to have a better conversation about more education on on what the rules of the road are and, and being able to accommodate these types of vehicles into our transportation network. And I, I think we need to kind of take a bigger look at it and see if this isn't a good entree to be able to uh, bring that conversation to the public and I will support this legislation. And thank you very much. Thank you, Director Starker. Director Williams. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just wanted to, um, to, to pipe in here. Uh, obviously this is a, a pretty um, important bill coming through. Uh, we have been in contact with Ms. Yuvin and, and Denver Streets Partnership, none of the other uh, advocacy groups, uh, hearing them out. Denver has a process for vetting legislation. Um, we are still in that process. We'll be abstaining, but we will be monitoring this bill very closely. Thanks. Thank you, Director Williams. Um, Director Hazeman. might just be a residual hand. I think that's the case, Director Kraftwerk. You're muted. I was brilliant. Um, are you ready for a, a motion? Um, yes. I would like to make the motion if that's okay. That'd be great. I'd like to move that we support this bill as amended to include um, an education requirement. Thank okay. you. Could whoever seconded just let us know who it was for the minutes. Hey, uh, Director Hazeman seconded. Thank you very much. And then um, Director Kraftharp, I wonder um, if I could make a friendly amendment. So I was just trying to keep track of the types of things that it sounded like there. It sounded like generally um, there are differences of opinion. There are some differences of opinion, but generally I heard more um, supportive comments and it sounded like we were generally in support. There was a lot of interest in adding education. Um, it sounded like there's um, interest in discussing some other topics. So it seemed like people could live with it as is, but if there was discussion around the speed limits, clarification on low speed conveyances um, and um, speed limit and education you already mentioned. So yeah, just those three things, education, speed limits and um, clarification on low speed conveyances. It seemed like we had some more flexibility around those topics um, for, for the lobbyists to play around with. Does that seem like okay friendly amendment? That's fine, yes, thank you. Is the that second, okay with the seconder? The second accepts the amendment. Thank you. Um, and then just folks, if I didn't capture the comments, if I missed somebody that felt like they brought something forward on that same vein, um, please raise your hand and, and reiterate it because I was trying to keep track. All right, and I think this, um, there's, it was obvious that there is some differing of opinions on this one and that's totally acceptable. So I just need people to keep their hands up for the voting component. And it looks like there might be a couple more comments before we get to that. Um, director first. 
I'm, I'm sorry. I meant to get my hand up earlier, but is there an age requirement? <laughs> and and I'm, I apologize because I, I do uh, agree with some of the concerns earlier on the safety aspect. Like my seven-year-old daughter is not making a great uh, decision on crossing an intersection. Um, you know, at any type of speed besides, you know, so I, I would hope that children are required to stop still, but maybe um, that's left out of the bill. I just wanted to be something considered or discussed. Mr. Morrow? As far as I know, and I've looked through the bill, I don't think the bill specifically addresses that, uh, but I would suspect that maybe there's something in existing statute around that issue. We could certainly research that more. Understand. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I, I, you know, I take my daughters on bike rides quite often, and as much as I hope I'm training them, I don't think they're ready for that. All right. If, if we find that it's not really addressed anywhere in statute, we could certainly raise that as an issue. Thank you. And then um, uh, Director Cockrell. I just wanted to second that concern. I think that's a a critical issue that was just brought up by Director Hurst. So thank you. Um, Director Wheelock. Sure. Um, I, uh, you know, to qualify my previous statement because it kind of ties into what we just heard. Um, it occurred to me that, that riders of different ages uh, gain different uh, sets of skills as they come along. And the 15 mile per hour thing also relates to newer, newer riders that I've seen in many places when we've changed laws. I'm sure this has been successful where it's been implemented and I support it. I'm glad to hear and it, and it eases my mind that 15 miles an hour apparently is working in some other places and they haven't seen bad consequences from it. I'm all for enhancing mobility and having more people on bikes and getting them out of cars. So I'm almost 100% there. The one catch is that as I've seen cyclists um, as I've seen cyclists, and it's usually not going to be your racers and your top riders, but as I've seen, they still they, they still adhere to the law of Darwin above all others. Um, but I've seen people who, once they get a new law for cycling, push that law to its limit already when the law and the changes that we made in the last few years, whether it's riding to abreast and making sure that that um, you assert your right to be able to ride a few feet out into the road, even when not necessary. And so I'm just hoping that as riders come along, they don't assert their right to be able to fly through that, through the sign, through a place at 15 miles an hour. And if you just go out and ride 15 miles an hour through an intersection in the city, if you haven't done it, I'm sure many of you have, I'm not risk averse myself. I said that a moment ago, you know, I'd be the poster child for the, for the reason to make a slower speed on this thing. But, um, uh, but, but I want to express that the same thing happens with newer riders and also those who are uh, intent upon furthering cycling to the extent that they press the law to, the, to its absolute limit. And um, um, anyway, it's not driven by fear so much as having watched it, having watched it, having watched people evolve over time. And there are always new people coming in. That's why I preferred the five to 10. And I've talked to a few people in Jeffco and others that are supporting this, other commissioners and told them the same thing. And, and you know, we both ride, we get it, we understand. Thanks. Thank you, Director Mulvey. Yeah, thank you. Um, these comments of Director Hurst really resonate and we have a community full of children and we want them to be able to ride their bikes to school with Director Wheelock's comment in mind as well. I'm not sure that this is a good choice for these children and to enhance mobility among anybody other than those who engage in racing style cycling. I'm also thinking about other low speed vehicles. We've accounted for that, but um, not every community has some of the concerns about other low speed vehicles. But for example, this, are golf carts included? <laughs> I mean, I got people crossing streets in golf carts and I've got kids trying to cross a four a four-way intersection with, you know, four lanes. It might work in some areas, but not in every area. So I'm just not seeing this as a safe solution for the additional reasons. 
Thank you. And so I don't see any other hands, so we will um, vote next. I just want to um, say I think some of the questions that we have are actually answerable questions um, that with a little bit more research and information, um, staff will be able to bring back something to us. So perhaps in between this meeting and next, if um, Executive Director X, if you could kind of send out a summary memo on some of these things that are knowable and that the bill actually contains in it that we just don't have ready tonight for, for members. We can do that. Thanks, Executive Director X. Um, so first, if I could have members that are abstaining from voting on this um, bill, raise your hands. And just looking through the screen. Thank you, everyone. If you could put your hands down, please. Those in favor, please raise your hands. And Melinda, my hand is up even though it's not up. And I see your hand as well, um, Director Pulaski. Okay. All right, thank you. And so that um, it is very narrow. It was 16 to pass, I believe, with our two additional hands, it was 18. And those opposed, um, if folks put their hands down, if they were in favor, sorry about that. And then those opposed, please raise your hands. Thank you very much. So the, um, the position is taken that we will support um, and give staff um, some leeway to talk about adding in education, um, discussions around speed limits, clarification on low speed conveyances and age of the, of the riders. So thank you very much, everyone. And Rich, do you have other bills for thank us? Thank you. We just have one last bill for you uh, that um, we really um, are, more than anything, I think putting this bill on for to, to just to give you notice that it's out there. This is a bill that um, would make some rather significant changes to the makeup of the uh, Transportation Commission and um, how the uh, how it's appointed and or uh, created and then also the uh, appointment of the uh, executive director of CDOT. Um, it otherwise it doesn't really directly affect Dr. Cog, but since we interact with CDOT and we know it'll be a bill of uh, some interest out there, uh, we thought it uh, prudent to put it on your list. And we're just asking for a position of monitor unless the board um, sees fit to uh, take a different position. Thank you very much. Um, any questions about this bill or uh, proposed motions? from a big discussion to no hands. Uh, we could have a motion to frame the discussion. I mean, the staff's position is to monitor, to stay on top of this and provide us input. Director Prathler. Sorry, I thought I saw a... No, I was pointing at Kevin Flynn. <laughs> oh, you know what? I didn't see Kevin's hand. Huh, something is funny on my end tonight. I'm sorry about that, everybody. Director Flynn. Thank you. That, that's not that's not actually my hand. This is my hand. So anyway, we all seem to be in different positions. Anyway, my screen doesn't look like yours. I, I'll make the motion to on the, just to have, engage discussion that that we take a position of monitor. But I did also want to ask Rich, uh, does this have any legs? This seems like a substantial change, and I've heard no uh, I've heard no foundation for it yet. That seems to come out of the blue. Uh, but I'll make the motion that we uh, monitor. So before we have Rich answer the question, is there a second on the motion? Director Lindsay? That's second. That's second. Oh, thank you, Director Pulaski got it in there. Um, and so, uh, Mr. Morrow, will you please? Sure, and I'll just say, and, and also if the lobbyists or if uh, other staff wanna comment as well, but from my perspective, um, yeah, yeah, it's a pretty major significant change. Um, I've not been aware of any sort of 
discussions about it or stakeholder process about it. As far as I know, it, it's pretty much come out of the blue. Um, it doesn't have a house sponsor. Um, and uh, uh, as far as I can uh, tell, I, I wouldn't expect it to have uh, legs as you, as you described it. Okay, or, or wheels. As or wheels. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, that's all. Um, any other members have comments or questions on this one? I, I think this is personally fascinating to monitor. So I appreciate the recommendation um, of monitor. A few years ago, there was um, a group that the uh, staff facilitated around uh, regional transportation district. And so um, I just will find it fascinating the positions people take based on the positions they took on that same conversation about a very similar topic. So I look forward to seeing how this turns out. Any other discussion? All right, all those abstaining, please raise your hands. Thank you for that. And you can lower your hands. All those in, oh, sorry, I'm a little too fast. Finish lowering, well, if we could just finish lowering everybody's hand. Thank you. All those in favor of the position of monitoring, please raise your hand. Thank you, and we can lower those hands. All the, sorry, that was a little too fast. All those opposed, please raise your hands. All right, thank you everyone. The motion carries to take a position of monitor on this bill. And Mr. Morrow, do we have any more we need to take up? We do not. All right, thank you everyone. Thank you. Um, that was a lot of good work. So thank you very much. And so that will take us to our next informational item, which is the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan Greenhouse Gas Revision Kickoff. And so Jacob Rieger, our manager in transportation planning and operations will tell us about this this evening and you'll find it as attachment F in your packet. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you everyone. Good evening, happy new year. Thank you for hanging in there. Um, luckily, I do have a short presentation that I'm pulling up. Um, I know the hour is getting late, but I do want to make sure you all are aware of this information. Give me just a second. Okay, Madam Chair, could you confirm that you all can see the presentation? We sure can, thank you. Okay, great. So as Todd alluded to earlier in the discussion of the Transportation Improvement Program, um, you know, there's some linkages with the uh, 2050 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan. Um, at the same time that we're doing some TIP work, we'll also be doing some 2050, as we call it, RTP work uh, related to the new um, greenhouse gas uh, rule that was adopted by the Transportation Commission late last year. So this is just a short introductory presentation, um, but I want to make you all aware, especially for the new board members um, of this work that's upcoming um, over the course of this year. Um, first, as you all know, that there's many requirements in the GHG rule for Dr. Cog. Um, as pertains to this conversation, one of the most important uh, requirements is that we need to um, we need to review and assess our plan um, by October 1st of this year, and we need to demonstrate that our plan, our 2050 Regional Transportation Plan, meets the emission reduction targets specified um, in the GHG rule. Um, so for some of our new members, there are many things in the GHG rule, but one of them is that it actually sets targets for several time periods um, between now and 2050 for the Dr. Cog region. Um, and it's our 2050 Regional Transportation Plan that's on the hook uh, for demonstrating compliance with those targets. Obviously, this is a process that's brand new to Dr. Cog, so I'll just be transparent and say there's many unknowns. We'll be figuring this out together. Uh, I'm gonna tell you sort of a brief overview of what we think we know at the beginning of the process, but we will be giving you regular updates um, as we go through this. Um, at the same time that we're doing this GHG work, uh, our process also includes the opportunity to propose what we call routine project-based amendments to the 2050 plan. Um, this is something that we typically do um, approximately once a year. Uh, we have federal requirements that we do a major update to the plan every four years. That's what the 2050 RTP was that we adopted um, in April of uh, 2021. Um, in between those four-year updates, we do annual updates. Um, so at the same time we're doing the GHG work, uh, we're also doing sort of a strategic uh, limited opportunity for project-based amendments to the plan. We're also, of course, collaborating with our 
um, agency partners at CDOT and RTD, but particularly with CDOT, um, as they look at their upcoming, what they call their 4P process um, and their targeted review of their 10-year plan. Um, again, ultimately, uh, whatever changes they make in their 10-year plan need to be included and reflected in the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan. And again, ultimately, it's our 2050 plan that needs to demonstrate compliance for this region uh, for the GHG emission reduction targets. Um, so obviously, as I've said, as we go through this process, uh, we'll have very close coordination with all of you, um, your staffs, at your local governments, our committees, and other stakeholders throughout the region in this process. Um, I mentioned the project-based amendments. Um, again, um, this relates to what we call fiscally constrained or really cost feasible um, project changes that need to be made in 2022, again, given that we have an annual cycle um, and four-year updates. Um, so we, you know, we were looking for changes that need to be made now. Um, as I've said, the RTP is typically amended annually uh, with our major updates every four years. We opened this solicitation back in mid-December and for most of the region, we closed it last week um, for those communities that were um, devastated by the Marshall Fire. Uh, we are giving them uh, a couple more weeks till January 28th to submit amendments um, if they have them. Um, believe it or not, this is the simplified version of the schedule. I believe there's a more detailed version in your packet, um, but just a couple highlights here. So we're in the blue part of the schedule right now um, in terms of the call for amendments and then staff is starting to review the amendments that we've received so far. As we get into kind of the orange piece here, um, this relates to both our uh, typical sort of federal work that we do, federal requirements related to fiscal constraint and air quality conformity uh, that we need to demonstrate anytime we make a major change um, an amendment or an update to the plan, but also obviously with the GHG rule, the GHG analysis that we'll be conducting um, over the next several months. Because this is a new process for us, we are allowing for um, up to three iterations, uh, just sort of multiple iterations of GHG analysis. We'll need to see kind of, you know, how close we're starting from um, and how much work we need to do to meet the emission reduction targets. Um, so that's work in the spring, and then as we get to the yellow portion of the schedule in the sort of late spring into summer, uh, we'll be preparing our plan documentation, um, both of course the revised 2050 plan with the amendments um, that, um, that have come forward, um, as well as you know whatever changes we need to make as part of the GHG analysis, and then we'll be preparing at least one new document called the GHG transportation report, and depending on the tools that we use to demonstrate compliance, um, if we have to, we may need to prepare something called a mitigation action plan. Um, those those uh, latter two products, the GHG transportation report, and if we do it, the mitigation action plan, those are new products for us that will, uh, the GHG will require uh, be reviewed by state agencies um, as well. That really gets us to the green part. Uh, we do this every time that we make a change, a major change to our plan. Uh, we'll have public and stakeholder engagement throughout our planning process. Um, but in particular, as we get into summer, our 30-day public comment review period that we do every time uh, we make a change to the plan, um, public hearing in front of all of you, um, and then committee and board action on um, these sets of documents and the final kind of revised plan. We have calibrated the schedule that you all would take action tentatively at your August meeting, leaving September as a backup if needed. Um, obviously, as you can tell, this is a very aggressive schedule for the work that needs to be done. But again, we need to meet the state deadline of October 1st to do this work. Um, so just a sort of introduction of a little bit more detail about how we think we're gonna start out going through this work. Really the first step and the first bullet here, verifying emission results of our adopted plan. So the, the 2050 RTP um, that you all adopted back in April, that's the first place we start. Verify emission results of the adopted plan and test the full set of RTP investments against the emission reduction targets. And that really sort of sets our baseline for us. Then we get into the first round of the GHG analysis over the next couple months. This will of course include any proposed project-based amendments that I referred to. We'll run our travel demand model and then the state agency CDPHE, which is the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment, will then run, um, basically it's a, a different model, it's called the MOVES model, um, but let's think of it as a GHG emissions model um, for the results for the time periods that I indicated that we need to demonstrate compliance um, as you see them listed here, 2025, 2030, 2040, and 2050. We determine then if the results meet the GHG uh, rule reduction targets from the adopted, or excuse me, for the adopted 2050 RTP uh, for each of these future years. And if this first round of GHG analysis and results did not meet the reduction targets, 
um, for any or all of the future analysis years, then we need to kind of do this again and conduct some additional analysis. Um, and if we do that, uh, we do have several strategies and tools uh, to meet the emission reduction targets. Those are um, sort of made allowance for in the GHG rule, things that we can do uh, with our model and some other tools that are available to us. Um, so we'll need to see how close we get and how, how much additional analysis is needed. So with that, I know it's a little bit of a drink from a fire hydrant, but I wanted to give you that initial overview. Happy to answer any questions now and my assurance that you will be hearing from me and my team on a regular basis over the next nine months as we step through this work. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, um, Director Rieger, for taking us through this. It is time sensitive and a lot of information. So thank you for introducing it to us as an informational briefing. And then I'm sure you'll be taking us through the process as we have to make this um, happen over the next period. So do folks have questions tonight? And it's okay. If you didn't totally understand everything, we're gonna be walked yeah. through this throughout the year by staff. And if you do have questions um, on every single briefing and every action item, staff puts in there the direct staff contact email and phone number. So if you think of something, um, you can contact them at any time. Not seeing any questions on this tonight, but people are welcome to reach out to Jacob um, in the future or one-on-one -on -one for more information if needed. And so that takes us to our committee report. And um, so first we'll have a report from the State Transportation Advisory Committee, Director Maurer. Thank you, Chair. Um, at the January 14th meeting, there were no action items, but had a lengthy discussion on the 10-year plan and fiscal constraints. Many questions were asked, including several from Dr. Cog, and thank you, Ron, for helping with navigating that. Questions were in regards to adding transit to the 10-year plan, equity of projects after four-year projects have been funded, what funding sources are added to the statewide pot, and how they will be distributed. Um, and I won't go into any more um, for sake of time, but if anyone is interested, please contact me and I can forward the slide deck from that presentation as it was not included with the stack materials online. Um, there was, just to carry on with that greenhouse gas, there was an update on the greenhouse gas rule. The Transportation Commission had received many comments. Also expect to have a mitigation policy directive um, brought to stack by CDOT. And then the Transportation Commission will rule on that in April. Uh, several TBRs spoke up indicating that this does not give their boards much time to review and give input. So uh, it was asked um, that we get draft of this policy as early as possible. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you, Director Maurer. A report from the Metro Mayor's Caucus, Director Starker. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the Metro mayors have not met since our last meeting, and uh, therefore I have no report tonight. Thank you. Thank you. A report from the Metro Area County Commissioners, Director Baker. Thank you, Chair. Um, as I mentioned at our last meeting, in December, the MAC met, and uh, with the help of a group called Dimension Strategies, prepared a strategic map for where MAC is going in the future. And um, to begin the year, we're scheduling a second half day um, session with Dimension Strategies to fine tune that strategic map. And uh, that's tentatively scheduled for March 4th. And the reason it's being scheduled that far out is because between now and, and then uh, there are a lot of uh, conferences where uh, a lot of the county commissioners are going to uh, Washington DC in February for NACO. So um, that's why we've got it scheduled out that far. And that concludes my report. Thank you, Director Baker. And the report from the Advisory Committee on Aging, Director Sanchez Warren. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much. I'd like to talk to you about two things. We continue to uh, work with and advocate for older adults who are, who are homeless or facing homelessness, uh, largely because of increased rents. You know, someone's getting rent increase of $350 a month, an older adult can't sustain that. They don't um, have a way to increase their income. Um, also, many of those folks that were working are not working uh, because of COVID. Um, uh, 
we invited Lana Dalton from the city of Aurora. She's the homeless manager for the city of Aurora. They saw a 280% increase in homelessness um, related to COVID. Uh, and we really wanted to hear about, we were hearing some innovative ideas and things that they were trying to accomplish. So she came out and talked with us about uh, they're working to increase capacity to help older or to help everyone who's homeless. Um, uh, they're working on a new shelter, which would include permanent supportive housing, emergency shelter, which is really needed for older adults because many older adults, especially if you have mobility issues, won't qualify to go into a shelter. Um, and then a day resource center. Um, they are, uh, developing, they're going to bring in 30 pallet shelters. And the way she described it was these are like tiny homes, but smaller, just places to um, sleep and rest. They don't have bathrooms in them. Um, safe parking lots, they're expanding their safe parking lots and the patrols that go around those safe parking lots. And then they're trying to create an Aurora housing fund, which is um, dollars that are much more flexible that they can use on rent deposits or or hotels. Um, she was really kind. She said she really hadn't thought about older adults being being homeless or facing homelessness. And that's a that's a pattern that we're seeing with a lot of decision makers in these and these committees that are in um, working in the governor's office or for the governor's office. Um, we really want to just. Um, shout out that older adults are being dramatically affected. About 30% of our calls in the AAA are re related to housing. The other, we also got a briefing on Dr. Cog's um, uh, Veterans Directed Care Program. This is a program that provides a monthly budget for veterans to hire caregivers um, uh, and pay for medical services, pay for caregivers, pay for those services that aren't provided by VA. We've had this contract for a few years, few years with the Veterans Administration. I just want to give you a highlight. Um, we uh, saw a 22% increase in our enrollments in 2020, and largely due to COVID. Um, our case managers uh, doubled their contact with veterans because. Um, there was so these are folks that would normally be in a nursing home if there wasn't community-based options for them, and so they um, they were they're very isolated. And we doubled doubled our contact and our our outreach to these folks to keep them engaged. Um, we use video calls, virtual group get-togethers um, that help uh, the uh, veterans deal with post-traumatic stress disorder, as well as depression and anxiety. Uh, the good news is the program saw a 37% decrease in nursing home use for one year after enrollment, which is exactly what the program was designed to do. So uh, that was, a that was um, we've lost a lot of veterans in that program. A lot of folks died uh, to, during COVID, um, uh, of COVID uh, in that program. And it's been difficult for, um, staff, but they're doing a great job and we've we've had some success. So just wanted to share that with you. Thank you very much, Jayla. And next we have a report from the Regional Air Quality Council, uh, Director X. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have no report. We did not meet in, in January. Next we have a report from E-470 Authority, Director Mulvey. Sorry, I had to unmute. Sorry about that. No problem. We are meeting tomorrow, uh, so it would be a little bit premature. We have not had a meeting since I was appointed and since our last report. Thank you very much, Director Mulvey. And next we have a report from CDOT, Director White. Thanks, Madam Chair. Chair. Good evening, everyone. Just two quick things to uh, mention tonight. Uh, one is, uh, I know uh, Paul Josaitis was a familiar name and face to much of the Dr. Cog board. He uh, was the Region 1 Regional Transportation Director. That is our region that uh, covers the entire Denver metro area. He retired as of the end of uh, last year. And so uh, we wish him well. And he's on to, I think, a, a new job already just in the, in the private sector. We are uh, in the recruitment stage and got a great list of applications that we're going through the process now to replace that position. So I look forward to introducing the new 
Region 1 director uh, here in the coming month. The second item to note is our revitalizing Main Streets program, which has just been a phenomenal opportunity to really provide some funding to address a lot of the Main Streets um, across Colorado. We are, have another notice of funding availability out now. I put a link here in the chat, applications are due by February 4th, and I think you'll, you'll find everything you need on the website there, including a video of a recent webinar we had. And that's all from the CDOT end for tonight. Thank you very much, Director White. Next, um, Director Van Meter, report on Fast Tracks. Thank you, Chair and Directors. While I have nothing new to report directly related to Fast Tracks, I do have a couple quick RTD items to report on. The first is RTD redistricting. So every 10 years following the decennial census, RTD is legislatively mandated to, um, to revise the 15 RTD board member districts to achieve to the extent possible and even representation based on population. RTD is in the middle of that process right now. Um, there's an ad hoc committee of board members providing oversight and direction. And there are in fact two draft maps that are currently being considered. If you're interested in seeing the, the two proposed or potential or draft maps, the RTD website has information on the process. Also related to that, we have public meetings this week and next on the topic and public hearings scheduled in February. The goal is to have a map finalized and adopted by the board in early March. So that was one item. The other is um, RTD has released the Reimagine RTD draft system optimization plan for public review and input. Uh, the system optimization plan includes recommendations for service redesign and is serves as a route by route guide for service development between late this year and 2027. Comments on the plan are due by February 9th will be included in the final system optimization plan, um, which we're asking the board to formally consider in March of 2022. The understanding that full implementation may not be possible un until through 2027 due to financial constraints and workforce limitations. More information again, including an online mapping and comment tool available at RTD's website. So I just wanted to make sure the board knew about the redistricting, board members, and the system optimization plan. That concludes my update, thank you. Thank you very much. And so um, for folks who, have, this is their first meeting, the next whole section of items, they're informational items. We don't have presentations on or go over, but the information is always really good information. And as the executive director pointed out, there's some information on here that we will be voting on at the next meeting. So it's really to give us a heads up on those things. So do look through those. And if you have questions about those things, please do reach out to the um, Dr. Cog staff. Um, our next meeting is February 16th. Are there any other matters by members this evening? Seeing none, we are adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Esther. Everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye -bye. Be safe. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night. Good to be Thank here. You. Thank you. See you later. Okay. Bye-bye.